Hi everyone, I'm John C. Morley, the host of the J. Moore Tech Talk Show and Inspirations for Your Life. Hey guys, it is John C. Morley here, serial entrepreneur. Welcome to the J. Moore Tech Talk Show. Today is January 13th, uh, before we get into that. You know, uh, January 13th, uh, many people have, I guess you'd call it superstitions on, on this day. And, um, you know, it's a day that some people consider to be unlucky. But, you know, I think that's just a little bit of hogwash, uh, to be quite honest with you. You know, of course, things can go wrong any day and they can go great any day. So it's all about your perceptions. So why do they say that uh, February 3rd, uh, excuse me, <laughs> January 13th uh, is unlucky? Well, it's unclear um, about the negative superstition, but it began swirling around the 13th. And by a while, the number 12 has generally been associated with completeness, 12 months of the year, 12 days of Christmas, 12 zodiac signs. 13 is kind of like an oddball. And it's been associated with bad luck for some. In fact, you know, in some buildings, they don't want to put a 13th floor, 13th unit. Um, it comes from the ancient code of the uh, Hammurabi and the earliest and most complete written legal codes reported omitting the 13th law. Yes. Um, from its list of legal rules, according to history.com. So just a little fun for you guys there. Thank you for tuning in to the J. Moore Tech Talk Show. We have some great. Um, guests coming up um, next month, so we definitely want to want to stick around for that. But let's get into the show, shall we? All right. How many of you remember it was just, oh, only a few days ago when um, the airports were shut down? So what exactly happened? Well, you know, that's a great question. Um, they call it NOTAM, the FAA's computer system. And it halted all flights, United. So this critical Federal Aviation Administration computer system experienced an outage um, Wednesday and briefly halted all U.S. flights, providing airlines with a digital bulletin board of the crucial safety updates. So uh, the system is known as Notice to Air Mission or NOTAM. That's Notice to Air Missions or NOTAM. It sends alerts to pilots to let them know of conditions that could affect the safety of their flights. It is separate from air traffic control, and it keeps planes a safe distance from each other. But it's another critical tool for air safety. Now, NOTAM messages could include information about lights being out on a certain runway um, or a tower near an airport or not having the required safety lights working or uh, at an air show taking place in the airspace nearby. So I want to quote uh, what they said on CNN Business is, it's like telling a trucker that a road is closed up ahead. It's critical information, said Mike Boyd, uh, as I quote, aviation consultant at the Boyd Group International. And um, also what they were saying is today's FAA catastrophic system failure is a clear sign that America's transportation network... <laughs> needs to be significantly upgraded, said uh, Geoff Freeman, CEO of the U.S. Travel Association. So why is it, ladies and gentlemen, that we never pay attention to things until they actually become a problem in our life? Why? You know, I think that's a great question. Um, but a lot of times people don't have, they don't have the answers. And the reason they don't have the answers is because they're so inundated in what's going on in their life. Inundated. You know, air traffic control, safety. I mean, I would think that's like the epitome of people's lives, right? I mean, 
if you're on a plane, you trust that everything is fine. But when a system like that goes down, I mean, there was no backup either. No backup. So what the heck happened? And my question is, why did NOTAM fail? Well, the FAA says, and I quote, the computer failure that grounded thousands of flights was caused by two contractors who introduced data errors into the NOTAM system. Unspecified, as they said, personnel were responsible for corrupting the file, which led to the outage of an FAA computer system that sends the safety notices to pilots. Um, and so this came from an agency that monitors this. So the FAA says computer failures that ground flights is a problem, and they know something has to be done about it, but when are they going to upgrade the system? And so, um, you know, I can't believe there was no backup to this. This is what gets me. I cannot believe there is no backup system to the notice to air missions. So the next question you might be asking me is, how many NOTAMs uh, are used in av aviation? Well, uh, you better sit down. <laughs> So there are nine types of NOTAMs used in the aviation guide. Uh, this is according to the FAA. Um, so how to read NOTAMs, uh, a little bit interesting. So they have nine types in the classes. Um, so they have a class is an ICAO NOTAM, uh, which is distributed by means of telecommunication rather than a publication. They have a class two NOTAM or published NOTAM, um, it's a type of ICAO format, which is distributed by means other than telecommunications. In the U.S., a class two NOTAMs are distributed every 28 days via publication in the Notices to Airmen Publication NTAP uh, journal. That's that's pretty interesting if you ask me right now. And um, number three, international NOTAMs are intended for distribution to more than one country in the United States. The FAA has access to some, but not all types of international NOTAMs. There are two types of international NOTAMs that pilots may encounter. Uh, one's called a snow tam and one's called a bird tam. According to the ICAO, a snow tam is a special series NOTAM given in a standard format, providing a surface condition reports to notifying the presence or cessation of hazardous conditions due to snow, ice, slush, frost, standing water, or water associated with snow, slush, ice, or frost on the movement area. Now, snow tams are valid for up to eight hours or until a new updated snow tam has been issued. Uh, a new snow tam may be issued prior to the standard eight-hour interval if there's a significant change in the runway service conditions and a new runway condition report, or RCR, is then received. So uh, definitely interesting to, you know, what's going on, and I would have to tell you that uh, no TAMs are really, I should say, uh, pretty interesting because they're important for pilots. There's a domestic no TAM. It's issued in the United States and distributed primarily in the United States and sometimes Canada as well. And they're released using FAA rather than the ICAO format. There's a fifth kind of no TAM, civil, not AMs. And a no TAM that is not part of the military no TAM system is considered a civil no TAM. You have a military no TAM which is issued for military airspace, military airports, or through the military NOTAM system, uh, considered to be military NOTAM. A seventh type of NOTAM is a flight data center, or FDC NOTAM, a regulatory type of NOTAM, uh, regulatory NOTAMs like temporary flight restrictions, TFRs, change to an airway or modification to instrument approaches when they have procedure failures, or all flight center NOTAMs. We have an eight type of NOTAM, a center area NOTAM. In some cases, the content of an FDC NOTAM impacts more than one airport. In this case, the NOTAM will be categorized and located as center area NOTAMs under the Air Route Traffic Control Center or the ARTCC. So there's a ninth NOTAM, including the U and the O NOTAM. And the final category of NOTAMs are NOTAM Ds. Uh, and the D stands for distant and indicates the type of NOTAM that is being distributed both locally and to the area beyond the jurisdiction of the local FSS or the ATC. So what does all this mean? Well, the FAA communicates to pilots through the use of the notice to airmen um, 
and it can be issued for many reasons. And they provide important information on the abnormal state of some part of the national airspace system. Since NODAMs are written using a unique language and specialized contractions, if you'll be manually reading a NOTAM, it's important to review the FAA NOTAM. Um, a lot of these companies, they all like to have these very proprietary languages, right? And NOTAM uh, con contradictions are also listed in the appendix to supplement the useful information to the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge. So it sounds like NOTAMs are great, but it sounds like they are very bloody confusing. <laughs> um, I don't think I'd want to read a NOTAM. <laughs> so Apple, what the heck's going on with Apple, guys? Apple may be embracing touchscreen laptops. Touchscreen laptops. What the heck is that about? Well, I'll have to tell you that touchscreen laptops are going to be interesting. I will tell you that a touchscreen laptop is something that's very important to a lot of people. And over the years, Apple has added touchscreens to just about every computing device they have, from phones, tablets, smartwatches. But they have kept them from being the feature to its Mac product line, as uh, the list of that very long uh, continuing scroll of rivals did so with their laptops and, of course, their desktops. Now, in 2010, Apple's founder, Steve Jobs, described the concept of a computer with a touchscreen, then emerging trends among companies' competitors. So it looks like they're going to be embracing this too. It was just a matter of time, ladies and gentlemen. That's all it came down to. It was a matter of time. I will tell you that um, understanding a trend in a technology is vital. I mean, it's vital. It's not just important. It's critical for people's existence. Trends, right? Having a touchscreen, not having a touchscreen. Is that a luxury or is it a necessity? I think as software starts to evolve, more people are going to see that touchscreens are going to become a necessity. Therefore, the price of devices will be going down since they have to put this on for every single person. That's pretty cool, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, really, really cool. All right. So um, enough with Apple for right now, but we'll keep an eye on what Apple's doing as well as some of the other uh, great people are doing out there because I think trends are going to keep evolving. And although we might have fads, you know, back and forth, the name of the game is what do we really need in our life? I think that's the number one thing that people want to see. They want to know if they want to know if they really need to know something or if they don't need to know something. And why is it important? Well, because people get bombarded with so much information in their life that they just shut down mentally. And physically. So this means, ladies and gentlemen, that life, as we know it, will keep evolving, will keep changing, will keep morphing. But what we don't know is to what extent. To what extent. So we'll have to just keep an eye on that and see where, see, obviously, see where things go. But our life is definitely going to change. LinkedIn's having a moment thanks to a wave of layoffs. Wow. This sounds exciting. A typical LinkedIn feed might be full of posts about year-end reflections on leadership and professional goals and suggested life hacks for the year ahead. With a few posts from the CMOs offering uh, tips on brand strategy for good measure. And those posts are still there, but... Of course, tied in are many other things like job hunt offers, support for layoff friends and colleagues, and advice for coping with career hurdles. Now, some LinkedIn users are affected by recent layoffs, have even formed groups, support groups on the site aimed at providing assistance to help signing 
exit paperwork and aiding with connections for new jobs, even helping to start new companies together uh, for a general purpose. Now, one particular LinkedIn group of employees affected by November's layoffs at the Facebook parent, Meta, um, now has more than 200 members. Even bosses who are doing the laying off have turned to LinkedIn to explain themselves and just really try to be transparent with their employees. But unfortunately, gentlemen, they're just looking at the numbers. In the first year of the pandemic, it was marked by a widespread thing of layoffs in a lower paying retail services type world. And the past few months have been defined by something different, the prospect of white collar recession. Even as the overall job market remains strong, there have been this wave of layoffs in the tech, in the media industries, which happen to make up a core part of the LinkedIn user base. The normal state professional network has become both a vital lifeline for recently laid off workers and surprisingly lively social platforms. The LinkedIn mobile app was downloaded an estimated 58.4 million times worldwide in 2022 across the Google Play and Apple app stores, up 10% from the prior year, according to the research uh, firm uh, Sensor Tower. So the number of posts on LinkedIn mentioning open to work were up 22% during November compared to the same period in the prior year, according to the data provided by the company. So what does all this mean? I think it means that we as individuals, we as companies, we need to diversify. We need to be in a world where life is going to not catch us off guard. And so that means when something doesn't go the way you want, you need to be open to the change because something great might happen from that change. And wouldn't that be fantastic? If you could just know that your next opportunity is literally right around the corner, I think that would make a lot of people feel happy. But unfortunately, gentlemen, people just get scared and they don't know what to do. I know that makes you quiet for a second. I'd have to say a lot of people don't know what's going on in the world. Does that make you a little scary? Does that make you a little scary? I'd have to say that maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I think a lot of people are looking for answers in our world. They're looking for answers because their friends are getting them down. And uh, not to get into specific groups, but I'm going to mention one particular group. I'm not going to mention their name. Their attendance has dropped so much that groups are starting to wonder what's really going on. And are these groups going to survive? And I'd have to tell you that I don't know. I don't know. Because I think our world is not embracing online networking as much anymore. I think our world wants to meet in public, wants to meet in person, wants to understand what goes on in life. They want to understand that. And they don't want to have excuses. I think a lot of people in life, they make excuses. They make excuses. Why? Because they're afraid not about failing. They're afraid about how successful they may become. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. 
Think about that just for a minute. I'll have to tell you that understanding where we are in life will make a difference. There's going to be fads, ladies and gentlemen, that come in and out of our life every single day. Every single day. And if these come in out of our life every single day, then what does that really mean to you? I think it confuses you, number one. I definitely know it confuses you. And if it confuses you, then how do you get around that? How do you handle that? Oh, uh, guys, I would have to tell you that it's going to come down to doing some smart reasoning, okay? What does that mean to you? I'd have to say... that it's going to open up a new way of life for people. That's right. A new way of life, a way that is going to transform people into a mythology that they didn't even think was possible. That's right. I said they didn't even think was possible. Now, that sounds a little crazy, but you know what? It's not. Our life evolves every single day that we're in it. Every single day that we're in it, our life continues to evolve. And if our life continues to evolve, then... How will our life be different? I would say it's going to change because people are going to change. You heard me say that right. People are going to change. People are going to change. And as people change, they're going to become more creative. They're going to become more resourceful in their lives. More resourceful in their lives. That could be a really good thing, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, a really good thing. Everyone I talk to says, hey, you know, this isn't working. That's not working. So then I say to them, okay, if it's not working, then what are you doing in your life to make things better? Are you doing anything or are you just sitting around complaining? Because if you're sitting around complaining, then you really don't have a right to do that. If you can't speak up or you can't voice your opinion or you can't do something about your life, then why would you complain about it? Complaining is going to do nothing. Whining is going to do nothing. Hmm. The world. Every day, we try our best to become the better version of ourselves, as you know, and help others become better versions of ourselves. That's my mission in life. And I will tell you that Sometimes you get stuck. Now, not because you want to get stuck, but you get stuck. And I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, many years ago, I was I was doing uh, an assignment, and I was stuck on this one little piece. So I let the whole piece block me from doing any of the assignment. But what I learned is that you could still work on the pieces that you can and come back to the piece that you don't know. Now, that might sound a little cryptic to you, but it is the truth, ladies and gentlemen. It is the truth. If you get stuck on trying to find a job, figure out how you could be more resourceful in your life. More resourceful. 
And being more resourceful is something that I think everybody in their life wants, but they don't necessarily know how to be resourceful. If I say be resourceful, do you just like become it? Well, no, you've got to really dig deep within you to figure out what's going to make a difference in my life. What's going to give a benefit to other people? What's going to give that benefit? And if nothing gives that benefit, you know what? You're not going to be any better than you were before. Hmm. So when we talked about networking groups, and there's one, like I said, that I, I was with for a long time volunteering with. But like I said, we went from so many members attending and now going down to like just a few. Does that say something about people's purpose and the fact that they don't want to be on Zoom calls? I think so. I think that if you believe that you're going to fill your whole schedule and become profitable by just getting on Zoom calls a day, well, you're mistaken. Now, you might say, me, John, it works for some people. Okay, it works for some people. That's not everybody. And being in a B2B world, a lot of people on there and seeing the same people doesn't motivate others to come back anymore. So you try to switch it up. You try to change things. But people know that really it's about the time they have. You can't get more time. We all get 24 hours a day. You cannot get more time back in your life. No matter what you do, you cannot get more time back in your life. No matter what you do. So being smart about using time in the most efficient manner is probably one of the best pieces of advice that I could give you every single day of your life. All right. Another interesting story. Do you remember the days when we would go park the car and put money in the meter, look for money? Maybe it didn't even take credit cards back then. We'd spend some time looking for the money. Could be a couple minutes. Could be five minutes, 10 minutes. We get out, put the quarters in. And then we go to the restaurant or the store where we're going. And like, oh, I'm almost out of time. I better run to the meter real quick and put some money in because I think I'm out of time. You were out of time, a few minutes, maybe five, maybe 10. So imagine now parking your car, ladies and gentlemen. And if you don't park it and start paying for it within five minutes of occupying that space or if you don't come back within that five minute window, you, my friend, will get a picture of your car and a nice friendly violation in the mail that'll be sent within 24 hours. Very similar to the easy pass systems that we all see so very much. So very much. What do you feel about this, ladies and gentlemen? Talk to me. What do you feel about a camera system that's on a meter? that is going to take a picture of your car. If I said imagine meters with cameras, well, you're too late because they're already here. In fact, in Palisades, New Jersey, you will get a ticket in the mail. And this is going to be all over the place. The reason, because it's a revenue source. The revenue from these cameras has, they've said, been a windfall for the New Jersey town of Palisades Park, where drivers can no longer gamble that they will get back to their car before the meter runs out. This new type of structure um, in a meter look great in these towns, and they'll soon be getting installed over many other parts of New Jersey, as well as other states. About 500 of the digital parking meters have been there for several years. But Last summer, a pilot program began in which 20 were fully automated. <laughs> so we had the technology. We just started to exercise it now. When time runs out, the camera just snaps a pretty picture of your license plate and the potential ticket is sent, yes, to police who determine if there's been a violation. So let me back up with you. So the ticket is sent to the police because maybe the camera made a mistake and they want to make sure that before it gets sent to you in the mail, probably gets sent digitally, that you're going to be able to, yes, you're going to be able to 
how can I say, you're going to be able to ascertain by that ticket being sent to the law enforcement and figure out, is this a violation or is this just a mistake? So if you get a ticket in the mail, well, the good news is you don't have to pay it online. You can pay it by traditional snail mail. Um, business owner Rodolfo Elbon, I quote, has gotten a few. Every time I have to pay 35 cents every 30 minutes, I have to come back and put coins there, he said. Right now, police of the town do still issue tickets the old-fashioned way, riding up and down the streets on their motor cruisers or in their cars or walking the strip and just placing that violation card on your windshield. But of course, they're hoping to get the green light from the state to allow all meters to become fully automated. So what they said, according to Michael uh, Giantonio, it gives everybody a fair chance to get a parking spot who co-owns a pharmacy in town. He says in the, this densely populated area with not a lot of parking, the meters will work. He also says, if there's not turnover, then what's going to happen is one guy is going to park his car there all day, get on the bus, go to the city, come back, and get his car. And meanwhile, everybody's driving home or around the block. Hmm. That sounds pretty interesting. So you might be saying to me, John, when will meters be automated in New Jersey to give tickets? Well, um, they're waiting. They're waiting. If a meter's broken or jammed, don't park there. You're going to receive a summons. If the payment, payment kiosk is not working, you can make a payment at another kiosk or download the app. That might sound a little crazy, but you shouldn't be parking somewhere if the meter's not working. If they have a bag or a boot over them saying complimentary parking for the holidays, fine. All kiosks are usually marked with the cost and the hours. Some places can be as much as $2 per hour. And payments can be made through the kiosks or, of course, on the mobile app. Um, some places have the ability so that you can obtain parking permits, uh, non-transferable permits and weekly permits. Uh, a lot of places are discontinuing because they're losing money on that. They also have low-speed vehicles, LSV permits, and they can cost just about $200, which was in 2022. So LSV permits may be used in many designated LSV parking spaces. Um, where they're allowed. So what is a violation? A fine for a parking violation on an overtime meter is usually $35, okay? Uh, parking tickets may be paid online at njmcdirect.com. And you can literally click, pay a traffic ticket or a municipal complaint. You just can click the button. And you literally can pay it. If you wish to plead not guilty, just contact the municipal court and um, set up a hearing. It is unlawful to park any vehicle across any line or marking designated a parking space. You will receive a summons. Again, I must tell this to you. If a meter is broken or jammed, do not even think of parking there. You will get a ticket. If the kiosk is not working, go find the kiosk or download the app because just because there is a technical glitch doesn't mean that you have free right to park there. So you might be saying, John, how much is parking in Palisades, New Jersey? Well, parking there, you know, basically varies from place to place, but parking in Palisades, um, you know, has a, um, right now, um, a zone for their zones of up to two hours. And, um, generally the way that they, they work is, you know, you'll, you'll put, uh, you know, you'll put your money in the, in the meter or you will use, uh, let's say, uh, a credit card or, or what have you. So up to two hours they're saying is basically about 25, 30 cents. That's not 
quite a bit. And um, it also says that uh, they're now allowing no more than three hour parking between 10 a.m. and 9 p.m. So the thing about Palisades is there is a lot of free parking, but I think that's going to change because they want a revenue boost. And um, people that are residents um, can apply for a resident parking permit in the program. So digital parking meters give everyone a chance to find a spot. Smart parking meters could become installed in your town very soon. Meter parking in Fort Lee starts at a dollar, ladies and gentlemen, for 30 minutes to the maximum time permitted. Hmm. That sounds very, very interesting, right? So you might be asking me, John, what is the most expensive uh, parking meter in New Jersey? W what is that? Um, I'd have to tell you that parking in Jersey City, they say is a dollar an hour, sometimes two dollars an hour. Um, the boardwalk can be pretty pricey. Okay. Um, New Jersey's town makes the most on parking and Jersey city ranked ninth for three hour parking at $10 and 25 cents. Now, if you're wondering where you can get the most expensive parking ticket, well, I'm happy to share that with you. Unfortunately, that won't be a good thing for you. Uh, when you get that parking ticket, could be in Wildwood, New Jersey. Be prepared to pay up. The town's parking tickets there are going to be a lot more expensive in the state with a standard fine of $50. That's not all, though. If you don't pay your ticket within 10 days, the fine doubles, ladies and gentlemen, to 100 bucks. And if you still don't pay after 20 days, well, you'll be referred to a collection agency, which will add additional fees to your bill. In other words, it's best to just pay the ticket as soon as possible. Or better yet, ladies and gentlemen, don't park and not pay. Now, parking meters are operational in most areas from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., but it's best to always check the sign of where the parking meters are, or there'll be a placard either by the sign or by the pay kiosk. Um, so that's 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. on weekdays, including Sunday. Uh, Purple Heart recipients in many places and disabled, uh, disabled veterans are exempt from paying parking meters if they park for less than 24 hours. So a lot of cities have free street and parking lots further down the street. In addition, free lots fill up, as we know, very, very quickly. So um, typically parking in Wildwood is one to two dollars per hour. Uh, parking in Wildwood Crest is two dollars per hour. So that price tag is definitely a money maker for a lot of these places because let's face it these are tourist areas and they want people to park and they want to make money you know many of these parking apps will even tell you where there's a, a free meter to park at okay there's one meter that will have you paying three dollars and sixty cents per hour. Where is that, ladies and gentlemen? Hoboken. In fact, I hear that they might even be raising it again. So the bottom line is, if you got to park, try to find a parking space that's free. If you can't, well, then make sure that you pay for your parking um no paid parking sessions and no permit displayed on your window if you have one is a 65 dollar fee in many areas permit improperly displayed is 65 dollars, and a permit that's expired is 65 dollars. so that's very important but i do want to alert you to something called a parking meter scam this used to be um pretty big in the beach towns every summer and um, what happens is you would pay to park on a street by one of the places, let's say like a splash zone and a meter, and you 
put six hours on the meter. Two hours later, you come back to find a ticket on your truck. The ticket was for parking out of zone. Sound a little perplexing? So many people would call that number on the ticket and um, send someone to meet them. And he said that I was not parked in the lines. There is no sign that says anything about this. He said that the city refuses to put up signs to inform people about this. There was a tree blocking my door, he said. So I had actually moved up so we could get out. And this is how I wasn't completely in the lines. I was told that if I didn't pay the ticket, a warrant will be issued for my arrest. And he said, seriously? So the moral here is <laughs> when you come home, a certified mailer of the ticket and payment will be sent and a receipt. Over a month later, you'll get a failure to appear notice and confused as to why. Well, look up online and the info will show you for a different ticket that was issued three minutes before the one I already paid for. Yes, an expired meter. So there was one ticket on your dash from the two cops who you were talking to. But meanwhile, while you were talking to them, you just got a second ticket because the meter expired. That's pretty low. And there's no way the meter had been expired. So you could take a photo of the meter and um, show it to someone, and you'll notice that it's not going to go anywhere. So someone is running a scam here. Um, I remember myself personally being at, I think it was Seaside Heights. I parked my car. I put enough money in for, I think you could pay it for three hours. And I came back at about two and a half hours. And the meter said expired. Now, the meter said, a lot of these meters used to be, you know, manual. So you couldn't tell what was going on. So what happened with my particular meter is the meter got stuck. I got a ticket because they claimed the meter had already expired. I didn't know that the meter was broke. I had no idea that the handle was moving. How is that my fault? Of course, I had to pay the ticket for $45. I've got one other gem that I want to share with you. And you know who it's about? It's our good friends, ladies and gentlemen, at Google. Google, ladies and gentlemen, might be going to court again. Yes, they claim a Supreme Court defeat would transform the internet for the worst. But is Google really sharing the truth about the world, or are they just doing what's best for them? According to CNN, an unfavorable ruling against Google in a closely watched Supreme Court case um, termed out YouTube's recommendation engine could have been sweeping unintended consequences for much of the wider internet. The search giant argued in a legal filing recently. So Google owns YouTube. And they're fighting the high stakes court battle over whether algorithmically generated YouTube recommendations are exempt from big tech's signature liability shield. Section 230 broadly protects the tech platforms from lawsuits over companies, content moderation and decisions. But a Supreme Court decision says AI based recommendations do not qualify for those predictions and they could threaten the Internet's core functions. Google wrote in the brief. So we all know that Google likes to get around things, but let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, all these companies, Google, Facebook, everybody, they all play these games because you know what they want to do? They want to exploit you and go just below that gray line. That line, they stay gray, so it's not red, it's not black. They stay just in the gray so that they can actually cause you to pay up. That, ladies and gentlemen, I think is pitiful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, do you know who I am? I'm John C. Morley, serial entrepreneur. It has been an amazing privilege, pleasure, and honor to be with you this fantastic January 13th, 2023. I hope you'll check out Jay Moore Tech Talk again next week on January 20th. In the meantime, you can also check out our channel at BelieveMeAchieve.com. Look for the Jay Moore Tech Talk show. We'd really appreciate those likes, those comments, those follows, those shares. And of course, visiting 
our channels and making the choice to buy our team a cup of coffee, a fresh bowl of fruit, or perhaps a savory dessert. You know, we'll be so grateful for those pennies and dollars that we'll invest them to new hardware, new technology, new equipment, new software, even new facilities. They give you the most jaw-dropping, empowering, motivational content to not only move you off your duff, but get you information you need to know about technology to stay safe and use it effectively and efficiently. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. I got to say goodbye, and I will see you next week. Bye, everyone.